All right, guys, that's it. I'm packing my bags. I'm done. It's another week of selling. I think we're at the end here. Apocalypse now, recession's coming, election fears. Anything you think horrible is going to happen with the election is going to happen. September's a cruel month, and uh, I'm basically thrown in the towel. You know, it's uh, it's interesting to hear Ryan become now a perma bear. I think it more has to do with the <laughs> fact that you're still unwinding those Japanese carry trades. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's by a part of the selling this week because the yen continues to go up as the dollar continues to weaken because we know the Japanese central bank is going to be raising rates while we're lowering rates. And that's actually having an effect here on some of the selling. Um, and that's why maybe semiconductor stocks, which just got crushed last week, uh, were one of the worst performers, just like the NASDAQ. Um, whereas other parts of the market actually held up relatively well. Yeah, you know, Chris, I've been wondering why those unopened confirmations have been sitting on his desk for the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you can't get in touch with him. Ryan's been on the phone with his right, broker in Japan. Yeah. My, my Japanese broker's on the line. I got to go, guys. I got to <laughs> finish the podcast for me. But no, Bob, I think the question here is, finally, is this it? Are the cracks in the economy finally here? Is the selling warranted right now? Is there a reason why the 10-year treasury now is only 3.6%? Commodity prices are lower. Is the economy finally slowing? And finally, those naysayers are right. Well, being the nice guy that I am, I want to see his naysayers have at least one day in the sun. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't. No, there's no <laughs> way they're right. They've been, they've been dying for some bad news. I'm, and what's, such, what's the bad news? The unemployment rate's at 4.2%, guys. Is that bad news? Yeah, labor participation went up last month. If you look at uh, wages, they went by 0.4%. That was better than expected. Uh, real wages, by the way, that's overinflation. So yeah, I, I think they're still trying to find like a needle in the haystack here. And let's face it, guys, right? Selling is very normal. Chris, you remember last October, like all our clients wanted to jump off a cliff. <laughs> you know, everybody was really pessimistic. And it was kind of like the darkest hour was right before the dawn. That was right before the market started to take off. I mean, I wanted to jump off a cliff trying to talk my clients out of not <laughs> jumping off a cliff. Yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal. And, you know, the funny thing was, is that, you know, if you look at this bear market that we had last year, the worst of it wasn't last year. The worst of it was a year ago before October of 2022. The market was down way more. Well, September, October were bad both years and they're bad again this year. So I'm seeing a seasonal pattern here um, that maybe, you know, it's better to hold your positions uh, not get crazy because we have the election coming up and we do have a lot of uncertainty right now, but we do tend to see a lot of selling during these months of the year. Well, I'll tell you what, like a lot of the calls that I'm getting from my clients are predominantly political based. You know, I've got people are asking me questions like, oh, well, what if you're a Republican? You know, what if the Democrats raise the capital gains rate? You know, what if they go and invade my IRA? And, you know, this feels like 2020 all over again, where there's a lot of volatility up until the election. And then everybody realized that somebody's going to get elected. And the market went up. Yeah, Chris, I mean, you have the unfortunate uh, situation of being in a battleground state, Pennsylvania. So you get what commercial every two seconds, political commercial on the radio, on TV, knocking on your door, flyers down the street. I mean, it's got to be brutal in Pennsylvania right now. I get texts and phone calls. And because Ryan still has a Pennsylvania number, I just forward them all to Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, if anyone gives me any problems about the election and what they do with their portfolio, I just put Bob on. <laughs> he quiets them right down. Not a bad idea. Yeah. And we talked about that last week a lot, right? How, you know, don't let the election dictate your financial plan. But, you know, I, I think one thing we have learned here in the last week or two is concentrated risk is bad, right? Semiconductors stocks down like 13, 14%. The NASDAQ down like 13, 14% because there's a lot of semiconductor stocks in that index. Uh, whereas other parts of the market have held up much better. It's just not good to live by the sword, die by the sword. And this is why you want to diversify your money. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the funny thing is, is that, and we talk a lot of, about this in the podcast, is that in bull markets, the market seldom lets you in. And I think this is one of those times when the market is letting you in, but nobody wants to get invested because it seems scary. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to buy the dip until you get one, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've learned that a long time ago. But uh, the fact of the matter is there are, there's a lot of great opportunity right now because, you know, remember 60 percent of your return comes from appreciation, 40% comes from dividends, sometimes 50% if you're invested long enough. And dividend yields are at an all-time record high in terms of the dollar amounts, right? But even on a relative basis, right? You're gonna have a 3% money market soon. You can get 3% in dividends from blue chip stocks, um, get 5% from pipelines, 4% from you know blue chip real estate investment trusts. I mean, come on. 
it's uh you know it's like a kid in a candy store right now no it's a great point right because okay i sit in cash and we know the fed is projecting that the money market for the fed funds rates can be about three percent over the next 12 months and, and guess what the the money market funds are already getting their rates dropped <laughs> like i saw we had one that was paying five percent bobby put these out every single week uh now it's down to 4.9 percent in anticipation believe me those banks are going to lower those rates so quickly you don't know what hit you but meantime, to your point, you're getting 3 4% yields in the stock market. It's also a rising cash flow investment, meaning over the next couple of years, that cash flow is going to increase. So why would you sit in an investment where the cash flow is going to start decreasing? Uh, to your point, Bob, so it is a really good time to reevaluate your portfolio, especially the cash flow on it. You know, Chris, I think you might be onto something, right? At the beginning of the year, the pundits were saying six to seven cuts from the Federal Reserve. We've had zero so far. The stock market skyrocketed, right? The um, interest rates, you know, were high, and the economy's at an all-time record high. Earnings at an all-time record high. But the Fed, Fed cuts next week. Is that the opposite is going to happen? Now we're going to start to see GDP go down. Earnings start to drop. Is that the reverse effect? Is it, uh, you know, they finally start cutting, then everything goes the other direction? Well, I mean, I think, you know, if, if rates start to go down, people are making less on their money markets. I got to think that money's got to go somewhere. So I think at some point, you know, hopefully that money will find its way into the market and uh, continue this melt up. Well, yeah, that's a good point. It's like everyone comes to the same conclusion at the same time. So I think everyone's going to open their statement one day and be like, oh, wait a second. I'm only getting three and a half percent on my money market fund. What do I do? And you can get that panic in there. Um, but, you know, to your point, Bob, it's like two huge catalysts here are the fact that rates are lower, right? Because that means people can refinance their mortgage. It means they have even more money that they can spend on a monthly basis that they can't spend now. Oil prices have come down precipitously, which as you like to say, that's a tax cut for the global economy. So that only adds more fuel to the fire long term. It's hard to see that in the short term, of course, right? Because we have volatility here, but that only adds to our thesis the economy is going to keep running relatively healthy. And you know those profit margins are probably going to continue to improve. This is all good stuff. These are reasons to be optimistic, not pessimistic. Sounds like a raging bull to me, Chris. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-A, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And you know, Chris, I feel like in most households, A, you never learn about money. Um, in our household, not only do we learn about money, but we probably could invest someone's money by the time we were like 10. <laughs> because, you know, Bob was really always espousing his knowledge. And I think, you know, I don't know everyone's household, but, you know, dad, you spoke in a lot of what I would call euphemisms <laughs> or what we like to call Bobisms. So I thought we could talk a little bit about some of these Bobisms or euphemisms that you've come up with and how you can really apply it. I mean, really the kind of the crux of our pain capital management, but the tenants that we follow really come from a lot of these euphemisms that you've been saying throughout our whole life. And, you know, one that I always think about is, 
I've never met a rich pessimist, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of true when it comes to the equity markets, right? I mean, optimists tend to be more profitable than the, the naysayers. And I'm just curious, like, you know, where does that actually come from? Where did you come up with that? Because it's really been a theme throughout our life. And it's clearly uh, the way we invest money as a, as a philosophy. Well, you know, I think it's um, I, I, well, I natural. I think I was naturally born an optimist. Um, but as you know, as I uh, went through school, you know, and competed in track and then competed in business, you know, I always noticed it was the more upbeat, more forward looking, more positive person that was always the most successful. You know, if you go into a race thinking you're going to lose, it's hard to win the race, right? Um, <laughs> you go into a transaction thinking you're going to be taken advantage of, you know, it's usually, um, you know, it's usually written all over the person's face. So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, early on, I, I, you know, was exposed to a lot of cynics, you know, who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think that's probably why I always told you guys, like, you know, you want to be optimistic, you want to think positive, uh, you want to look for the positive result. Because, you know, most people I've met in my life, you know, who are successful are natural born optimists. Well, you know, and, and why it works with our portfolio is, I mean, let's face it, stocks go up like 70% of the time. Um, you know, we talked about this stat, we're going to talk about it again on the show today, but we're only in recession like 14% of the time, which blows my mind because most people in the media or most quote unquote experts tend to veer to the negative side, <laughs> but from an outcome perspective, that usually doesn't work out very well, uh, which is interesting to me because, you know, with odds that great, if you told me, you know, 70% of the time markets were going to go up, it would be better to have an optimistic attitude. Yet, you know, most people don't have that, especially on Wall Street, which kind of I find it really interesting. Well, to me, it's even more than that. You know, it's it's, it's to me, it's common sense, right? Because you know, my my optimism isn't Pollyannish. It's it's evidence based, right? We've had a stock market that goes up seventy five percent of the time. We have a, an economy that's in growth phase eighty six percent of the time. Real estate markets that have always gone higher. So it, it's more evidence based. And, you know, so there's a reason, you know, for my optimism, because it has, you know, it's coupled with being a truth seeker. I want to, I want to verify it. I don't want to be embarrassed either. But, you know, recently I was at a wedding and, and my buddy introduced me to his family. He said, first of all, uh, you know, you know, you don't know Bob. I've known him all my life, but he is the most optimistic person you'll ever meet <laughs> in your life. You can say this another way is Bob's optimism maybe outpaces his talent. Uh <laughs> <laughs> But well, I've actually had that said to me once, Ry. Right? <laughs> a very good friend of mine said, you know, Bob, you're, 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 you may not be as good as you think you are, but you're far better than everybody else. So. <laughs> we call that the reality distortion field. But, you know, I, I think it's a good point. And I heard this, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk is that, uh, that a little annoying guy on social media, but he actually made a really good point. And I think when we say pessimism sounds smarter, but he took it a, a step further. He says pessimism is lazy. And I think that's right. I think it's easy to say that things are bad. Um, like, you know, we, we talk about the, we've been fading these recession fears now for two years and it makes it sound like we're Pollyannish. But really, it's because we're really looking at the numbers and you see a lot of these people on TV, these experts, and it's laziness. It's lazy thinking, just saying, oh, well, unemployment ticked up a little bit. So we're going into recession. Um, you know, meanwhile, if you look at the demographics, you know, you look at wages, you, you look at all these different variables going on. Clearly, we're not going to recession. So I think optimism, not only is it not Pollyannish, but it's less lazy because you're thinking about things on a deeper level. And I think that's something, Chris, I would say that dad taught us too. It's just like, don't go for the superficial answer. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is, you know, dad, you always say that, that your optimism is evidence-based. And one of the things you always say is that risk is always realized in hindsight to basically say that you don't realize how much risk you're taking until the market actually goes for a downturn. Well, it's one of the things that's, um, I think, fortunate for the two of you, and especially in the business we're in, because, you know, I made all those mistakes early on. Uh, you know, you didn't have to make all those mistakes that lead to gray hair and scar tissue in your stomach lining. So that, um, you know, you, you, you find over time that, you know, human nature doesn't change, right? People are emotional. And, you know, when it comes to risk, right, risk and return are intertwined. And I don't think a lot of people, Chris, realize you know, how much pressure there is emotionally when you're in a high risk portfolio in a downturn. And, you know, you've seen it in your career and Ryan's seen his career, but, you know, you were forewarned about that, you know, and, you, and I, I think that's why people benefit from having our firm as, as their advisors, because we know how they're going to act before they know, you know, before they know what's going to happen. We know 
how they're going to act. You know, Dad, I, I feel like Ryan and I, and by extension, our clients owe you a debt of gratitude because you're kind of like the Jesus Christ of investing in the fact that you died for our sins. You know, you already <laughs> made those mistakes early on in your career so that we didn't have to. Well, I didn't die, Chris. My stomach line, you did. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like what John Lennon said, the Beatles are bigger than God. Um, it could be very dangerous to say that. But no, but I think it also goes back to, you know, another Bobism that I love that we grew up with is that, you know, technology evolves, but human nature remains the same. And it's kind of uncanny. You know, I've been in the business now for over 20 years. And it's just remarkable with all the information we have now with the, you know, the dawn of the internet. And we have all these different outlets for content. Uh, you can learn anything you want about finance now. And people have not improved in their ability to invest. They make the same mistakes over and over again. Um, which also ties into what you always talk about. There's no new errors, right? It's it's like, it's just history repeating itself over and over again. And it kind of rings true after doing this for a long time. Yeah, it truly does. And um, I, re I remember meeting down, a meeting with one of our uh, clients for the first time, uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago. And his spouse kept saying, you know, why did you keep going over these points? And I said, because when that time comes, you're, you're, you're not going to be brave. You're going to forget what you agreed to. You're going to forget that you're not going to panic. No, no, we won't do that. No, I guarantee you will. So please, <laughs> you know, bear with me. I'm going to go through this step by step because it's going to happen. And sure enough, it did. And it always does. But that's the thing. Human nature doesn't change. And, you know, really, you know, all those, all the years that uh, where you guys grew up, uh, a lot of the neighbors, kids, a lot of the guys you and gals that you played with growing up, you would say, hey, Mr. Payne, I want to I want to be you one day. You know, I'm going to go to college next year. What should I major in finance, economics? You know, what should I what should I get my master's in? And I told him, I said, abnormal psychology, right? That abnormal psychology is the perfect degree, you know, for what we do to help our clients become successful. They only really wanted to be Bob because he was wearing those Italian Zenia suits, right. Brioni shoes. Um, and that quaff, man, you know, it was always that always had the comb in the side pocket of the Jaguar. Right before you get out, look in the mirror. Yeah, yeah. It's not just the Jaguar. <laughs> to this day, you can open up uh, dad's car and there's always going to be a hairbrush there. <laughs> yeah, Chris, that Jaguar was a big mistake. <laughs> that oil stain, that oil stain still in that garage where we used to live. Bob's worst investment. That's right. Um, <laughs> well, you, you know, um, I, I remember, you know, you also taught some hard investing euphemisms. And, uh, you know, one of those is that the obvious trade is always the wrong trade. And I remember when I was a kid, you gave me, you know, you, you told me to take some money in my account and to go buy some stocks. And at the time, <laughs> the hottest stocks were Microsoft and AMD. So of course I went out and bought them. And uh, I think I ended up selling them like 10 years later at a loss. <laughs> you put a little Oracle in there too, Chris, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I, I don't think I did Oracle, but you know, your memory might be better than mine. Yeah. It was a painful time in my life, Dad. No, it's, it is uncanny, but I mean, whenever everyone wants to do the same thing at the same time, and you can argue right now, the Magnificent Seven might be that same type of trade um, eventually it doesn't end well when, right. When everybody says, Hey, let's buy banks right after the banking crisis a year ago, or a year and a half ago. Um, of course, banks went way lower after that. It's just, it's just amazing when everyone wants to do something in unison, it never works out. <laughs> it's, it, it is really to your point, Bob, abnormal psychology, but the psychology of investing is like a real thing. Um, and I think because we deal with so many individuals on a daily basis, we get to see what those themes are. And actually arguably gives us kind of a, a an advantage because we kind of already know what the group think is. And we know typically group think doesn't work out that well. So being a little bit counter tends to work in our benefit. But that's kind of, you know, what our practice is now. It's like this little experiment we have, right? <laughs> a social <laughs> experiment to see if people yeah. can actually evolve and change. Um, and they truly don't. And, you know, you yeah. And I was fortunate, you know, because I came into when I started working at Merrill Lynch, it had just become big for retail investors to start investing in the stock market, right? We came out of the 60s and then they had the big bear market in the late 60s. So I was fortunate to have a lot of mentors, a lot of people who thought long and hard, um, you know, about the psychology of investing. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that, uh, you know, like, you know, all markets revert to the mean, you know, came from one of my mentors back at Merrill. That's cool. Because the, the other thing too, I think though, one of the biggest differentiators and something that you came up with a long time ago, or maybe stole it, I don't know, um, is goal-based investing, right? It's so simple, but it's so powerful. When you attach people's investment plan to their goals, they're just so much more likely to stick with the plan. 
Um, and it is, it's a simple concept, but I mean, I could say with the 80 or 90% of the portfolios that we review, they're not goal-based. They're not based on people's goals. And I'm curious, like, how did you come up with that? Or how did you steal it? Because I think if anything, that's probably the most powerful idea um, that you came up with and that we use at Pain Capital. I, I, so I would be kind of curious of the genesis of that. Yeah, you know what, Rye, you're right about that. That, um, that, that whole movement, I mean, I actually started a movement within the firm, but it was really, you know, just when I started with, you know, Merrill Lynch in the 70s, um, I was very proud of the fact it was the, the best firm on the street. We were the thundering herd. It was a very proud moment. It was a great place to grow up in the industry. Um, but I'll tell you what, after a couple of years, I was bored to tears and I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to do this anymore because, you know, basically they were a product pushing organization. You know, you had the investment bankers on one side, you know, who are the white shoe part of the firm. And then you had the financial advisory side. So the, you know, the in, investment bankers would create investment products. And then our job is to find people to sell these products to. And I thought, you know, I'm not doing this the rest of my life. And, and, you know, how can you have an investment that is suitable for everybody, right? The whole thing was, you know, you have to have suitability. So one day I just stopped going to, to the office. I, I stopped going yeah. to the office, stopped, started going out to meet my clients. And, you know, my manager said to me, why are you going to meet your clients? I said, well, you know, it's kind of like Willie Banks, you know, that's where the money is. Um, you know, you're not gonna, you're not going to get that money over the phone. So I started to sit down and, and what I found was, or I thought this was a large investor. You know, if you looked at an investment pyramid, I had like the very tiny tip of the pyramid, the most risky part of their portfolio. And they had all these safe dollars, you know, down at the base of the pyramid it was exactly where it should be. And I thought, well, I should be handling that, right? That's, you know, if I'm going to do this, I want to be handling a lot of money. And so I, I started to figure out what the client needed. And then the, it, like this aha moment was, I'm not going to sell what the firm tells me to sell. I'm going to come back with what my client wants and tell the firm to come up with that investment so that I can deliver the return they need. And that's how the whole A to B approach, the whole consult consultative process, you know, was launched. You know, I think that's how uh, Steve Jobs developed the iPhone. You know, he found out what the consumer wanted and uh, brought it to market. So some could say that you're like the Steve Jobs of the financial world. But what a novel idea. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> creating an investment philosophy that's actually good for the client, um, which sadly, even today, right, it, it's the industry is not really like that. Um, but it is, it is between night and day, right? People achieving their goals. People have something to focus on. And, and that's invariably to the ups and downs of the market, that's what a successful investment financial planning, planning strategy looks like. But so simple and so powerful, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, they, they didn't like disruptors uh, in, the, in the industry back then. And, you know, don't mess something up where they're, they're you know, all they really cared about was the bottom line, right? It, as much as they say, you know, the customer comes first, but it, back then it, it truly didn't, still doesn't, you know, the, the stock price comes first. Um, but, you know, we had a... Um, a huge event in 87 where the market went down 35% in two days, which was, you know, statistically impossible. Um, and suddenly um, that was, you know, in 87, 88, and then 89, you know, my practice was growing like a weed and the firm took notice. And that's what it, you know, why it led to me you know, training everybody in this new way of doing business, this consultative process, because they realized that, um, you know, they were taking a lot of risk just selling products you know, to anybody who came through the door. Dad, of all the euphemisms or Bobisms, what is your favorite Bobism and that has served you the best in this business? I think the one that's like universal in its application, Chris, is time passes and markets operate. Neither cares how you think or how you feel. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you all right bob since 1945 there have been 13 recessions that lasted 10.3 months on average the great recession which began in december of 2007 i remember it officially ended in june of 2009 the economic downturn was the longest since world war ii lasting a whole 18 months the shortest one lasted two months from february through april of 2020 during the pandemic the bottom line is we're not in recession very often, BP. No, we're not, but there is this obsession with recession. I call it the recession obsession, right? But, <laughs> you know, you take a look at what happened at the, in the great financial crisis. 
you know, the market topped long before the economic numbers started to go down. And then, you know, once you realize you're in a recession, the market had already had a huge drop. And then the market bottomed in March of 2009. And it wasn't until June or July that the government recognized we were out of recession. But at that point, it already rallied thousands of points. <laughs> so, and, you know, after you have a big drop, you know, if you're going to use, you know, the recession as your timing mechanism, man, I can't think of anything worse. You know, you, you sell low and you buy really high. Yeah, it sounds like a bad combination. And it's just like these, these perma-pessimists. So they're right about, well, you know, 14% of the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> better be optimistic. Chris, 497,000 is the number of 401ks at Fidelity worth more than a million dollars. That's a record up 31% from just last year. U.S. household stock allocations have steadily inched up this year, according to J.P. Morgan, and recently accounted for roughly 42% of total financial assets. That's the most on record going back to literally 1952. People have clearly got more aggressive with their money. And also that, going back to what Dad said, it doesn't sound very recessionary that more and more people are contributing to their 401ks or 401ks are growing. That sounds very bullish to me. Well, I think it's another reason why people are spending, right? They feel wealthier right now. If you look at the net worth, when you look at people's houses, along with their 401k balances, that helps people to be very positive on their spending outlook. Well, I'm going to steal a line from Clint Eastwood. Instead of saying, do you feel lucky punk? I'm going to say, do you feel wealthy punk? Well, do you? <laughs> Depends on who you are, right? I think we all feel like we could always be wealthier. Uh, but that's just my take. Bob, the makeup of the U.S. economy today is very different. Services have risen to nearly 46% of overall gross domestic product, while goods have slimmed down to just 22% of the overall economy. Furthermore, there has been a shift away from capital intensive businesses. Hence, the economy is much less sensitive to interest rates than it used to be, even with the Fed hiking so many times in the last few years. Well, I think there's a gigantic lesson. We always say that history doesn't always repeat, but it often rhymes. And a lot of economists, a lot of experts, a lot of uh, financial advisors like us try to look in the past for clues of what the future is going to bring. And, you know, interest rates just don't have the impact on this type of economy like they used to. It isn't a capital intensive economy. And the, and the Fed, which we're actually waiting to see if they're going to cut interest rates next week, 25 basis points or 50 or, or maybe not at all. The interest rates don't mean as much as they have, at least in, you know, in my experience over the last 50 years. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why all these economists did get it wrong is because they thought higher interest rates were going to throw this economy into recession but we're just not as interest rate sensitive as we were going to that housing crisis. So, you know what, Chris, it's like Ryan always says, you know, it always works until it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, another great episode. Hope you enjoyed episode 174, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, give us a support. Give us that five-star rating, whether this is on iTunes, if this is on Spotify, you can subscribe to our channel. If this is on YouTube right now. You can subscribe like this episode, click that notification bell. To be updated every week of all our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. Stay loose as always and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to the Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at bebullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.